Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 12. Today's guest is Paolo Perjanian, an expert in robots. He first got into that at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, then became the CEO of Evolution Robotics, which made robots that could navigate around homes and clean the floors. Unsurprisingly, that company ended up being bought by iRobot, where he helped develop the essential technology of the Roomba. But he is now the CEO and founder of Embodied Inc., which makes a robot called Moxie. But Moxie does not clean floors. Moxie is for helping challenged children. Children with a social or emotional developmental challenge. And you can see on their website a video of a demonstration of Moxie. So there's this boy in his bedroom, alone. And you can tell from his expression that he's been burned before. He's been hurt. You know what kids are like. One wrong move and you're labeled for the rest of your time at school. And then his parents come into the room, obviously concerned and wanting to do the best for him. And they say, we've got a new friend for you. And they introduce him to Moxie, which is a robot about the size of a baby penguin. It's even got little flippers for arms, and a screen for a face, on which, when it's turned on, a face appears. And it says, Hi, I'm Moxie. I need to learn about the world. Can you help me? And Moxie strikes up a relationship with the boy, and over the course of days or weeks, helps to draw the boy out of his shell by asking questions, asking for help and having positively reinforcing interactions with the boy. Moxie can sense the world, can read emotions, can understand speech and the emotional nuance behind that speech. Now, that's an amazing development. If you watch that, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, and I hope that I've asked most of those in this interview. On the face of it, it seems like the ultimate challenge to build a robot that has to navigate such a difficult environment of helping a child, and an emotionally troubled one at that. Surely we should be tackling easier things first. We'll get into how Moxie is successful at doing that in this interview. Now, of course, Moxie is not supposed to replace the interaction of parents, other humans, or pets. But I realize that it is doing things that they can't. An adult cannot put themselves in a subservient role to the child asking for help. No kid is going to buy a therapist coming in and saying, help teach me about the world. A pet can't talk, so you can't have those kind of rich conversations about situations and appropriate responses. So there's an opening there in that problem space to be entered into, a small robot-sized opening. Now, people in the artificial intelligence community tend to shy away from robotics a lot because often the interviews that they get with the media are attached to a picture of the Terminator and it goes downhill from there. And the problem that robots have to solve of navigating around the world is a very messy one. It's not as pure and easily deconstructed as something like playing chess. Of course, even in the case of the Terminator, the real threat wasn't the robots walking around. It was the Skynet computer somewhere and its atomic bombs. But robots are really important to the development of advanced artificial intelligence because human intelligence depends almost exclusively on an understanding of the real world, the physical world. Think about any conversation that demonstrates intelligence and see how much of it depends upon physical world concepts. Unless you're at a political convention and the speeches are rife with 
abstract values like integrity and patriotism, almost all, if not all, of any conversation that you have that demonstrates intelligence is going to be dealing in descriptions and questions about the real physical world. So for any AI to demonstrate general intelligence, it's going to have to have the same level of understanding of the physical world. Now, how do humans get that understanding? It takes us years, starting as babies, when we don't even have the concept of object permanence. Babies think that when mommy leaves the room, she ceases to exist, hence all the crying. We can at least build our computer models with the concept of object permanence in mind. But every machine learning or deep learning model that we build with an understanding of some aspect of the real world, whether it's image recognition or speech translation, is starting from zero. Whereas humans, when we learn a concept like there's a cat, we are integrating that with years of knowledge about things in the real world. So when we meet some new species of animal, we make associations with similar kinds of animals. We make visual associations with things that have four legs and a tail. We make kinesthetic associations with things that have fur. All of these associations happen when we encounter something new and help us to understand that object now from many different sensory viewpoints. Whereas when we train a deep learning network to recognize pictures of cats, it needs a million pictures of cats, and it's starting from nothing. Literally, primordial ooze. An amoeba has more intelligence than this network does to begin with. So to advance our state of the art in general intelligence, we're going to need some kind of data structures that we can share with each other in the same way that now we have deep learning libraries like TensorFlow that get passed around and used. We're going to need data that represents an understanding of the real world, equivalent to what a human has acquired after at least a few years. And that means we're going to need a framework in which to put that, something equivalent to the huge number of associations that we make as humans. We don't have anything like that yet. We don't seem to be close to anything like that yet. So it's amazing just how far our robots have been able to get in understanding and dealing with the real world in this start over from zero every time model. The most advanced robots on the planet at the moment are autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. To operate effectively, they have to build an understanding of the real world that's equivalent to a fairly advanced level of what humans achieve. If you're driving down the street and a frisbee rolls out in front of the car, you have a different response to that than if a bowling ball is rolling in front of it. But visually, those can be almost identically. But you can recognize the frisbee, and from experience in knowing what a frisbee feels like, how heavy it is, what it's made of, that recognition of it visually triggers all of those other associations that tell you this is not a threat if I hit it, so I don't need to detour and risk some kind of other accident in order to avoid it. But a bowling ball, again, you have other associations that tell you, yes, this thing is a lot heavier and harder and could cause some significant damage, so I am justified in taking more drastic steps to avoid it. Whereas the visual recognition system of an autonomous vehicle may not be capable of that. So it has to fall back on other data like hopefully the ultrasonic or microwave or radar on the vehicle is able to determine the density of the object and that that's been programmed into it as an avoidance factor. This shows just how much information we integrate about the world when we're growing up. We're training our cat recognition AIs on just static monocular images of cats, but when a human encounters a cat for the first time, you've got stereoscopic vision that lets you build a 3D model that becomes more sophisticated and detailed as the cat moves around, and so do you. You get to touch it, you get to listen to it, all of that information gets associated, so that when you next see a cat, it pulls up all of those associations, and you understand what it is on a very different level from what would happen if you were looking at a statue of a cat, which would pull up associations of statues and hard metal things. 
the word we use in AI to describe an AI that is part of the world and understanding the physical world through senses is embodiment. Hence, Paolo's company's name, Embodied Incorporated. So the real key to the development of artificial general intelligence lies in building its understanding of the real world, and the path to that lies through building more advanced robots. What Paolo is doing with Moxie is definitely on the leading edge of that research. And so without further ado, let's get into the interview with Paolo Prajanian. Paolo Prajanian, welcome to the show. It is a great pleasure to meet you. Can you tell us something about what you did at JPL and iRobot to begin with? Absolutely. So uh, I had just finished my PhD in Denmark. And uh, one of my childhood dream jobs was was actually working for uh, NASA. Um, so I had already made some contacts while I was doing my PhD and got an offer to join JPL uh, in a group that was working on robots or rovers for Mars exploration. Uh, so I was there uh, for two years and part of a team developing robots for future missions uh, to create habitats on Mars and for other uh, science activities on, on, on Mars primarily. We were doing a lot of our experiments on Earth, obviously. Uh, so the Arroyo Desert just behind the JPL is where we would go because you have uh, pretty rough terrain there and you could do experiments with seeing how these robots uh, can maneuver in uh, climbing cliff sides or uh, going down fissures and stuff like that. Mm. And did you come to them with an interest in robotics already? Uh, well, I was just uh, pretty new in my career, so I wouldn't say that I came with them with a bunch of ideas. I came with skills and I helped them uh, develop a couple of things uh, that I think I will uh, say is my claim to fame at, at uh, JPL. So uh, one of the things I developed, I was the lead on this, but of course it's a team effort, uh, was a group called, uh, a group of robots we called CliffBots. And it was an ensemble of robots tethered together that would be connected to each other, navigate to find the cliff edge. And then two of the robots would separate, anchor themselves, and then help the other third robot to propel down the cliff side, feathered up to these two anchors. Mm. And the reason for the cliff side was obviously the uh, scientists, the geologists were interested in looking at the history of the planet and going through different layers you can get access to by going down a cliff side. Wow. So where did your interest in enthusiasm for robots date from? It's a very good question, and actually, uh, I know exactly what when it happened. So, uh, when I was in my teens, I was actually a refugee, uh, Armenian, born in Iran, ended up in Denmark as a refugee, and had fallen way behind him on my schooling because of all the sort of traveling from country to country uh, to get there, and then being in refugee camps for a couple of years before getting an asylum to be able to be integrated into the society. So uh, at the time, my idea in my mind was I was going to be a doctor because my parents, as any good immigrant parents, will tell your child, be it become a doctor. Uh, until by pure coincidence, I bought a computer. I think this was probably 1984 or something like that, uh, which was a Sony MSX computer which was a contender to, to the Commodore 64, which was the popular computer at the time. And that summer, I basically started coding all by myself. Uh, it started as a complete black box, and I started reading manuals, then I started fig figuring out how to pick and poke uh, and code, machine code, and then gradually got to a basic coding and all that. And I remember during the same summer, uh, I saw a documentary on this company called Pixar uh, on TV. 
And I saw the first animated short, which is Loxo Jr., which is the two lamps playing with each other, mama lamp and baby lamp playing with a ball. And I was so blown away by that because I, I was struggling making a pixel appear on the screen of my, my computer's monitor. And when I saw this, I was like, wow, how is that possible? How can you make this happen? Literally uh, having animated characters that can express emotions and so on. So that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And I decided to go to the university in computer science and computer engineering. And uh, while I was there, when I was looking to do my master's program, I was visiting different labs. I remember walking to the lab that was doing robotics and I fell in love with the robot the first time I saw it. And I decided to go that, that uh, basically followed my curiosity to get to that point and then have been doing that since. Ever since. And then you were at iRobot and made some significant contributions there. Can you summarize that? Actually, so there was one step be between there. So as, as I was at JPL and working on my dream job, I got contacted by Bill Gross of Idealab, who is a uh, multiple, uh, I mean, ser serial entrepreneur, but he actually calls himself parallel entrepreneur because he usually has an incubator with multiple companies going on. And uh, he wanted to start a company in robotics uh, and they were looking for a CTO. So he and I talked. Uh, again, the curiosity got the best of me and I was interested in learning about entrepreneurship. So I joined his company, uh, which wanted to become Microsoft of Robotics. It was way too early, very ambitious, and that didn't work out. But we created some amazing technologies in vision-based navigation technology. And uh, when that company actually failed, we spun out into a new co, which I became the founder and CEO of. Uh, which is Evolution Robotics, and we developed the world's first visual slam technology, uh, launched our own robotic floor care product for hard, hard floor cleaning. And that was really interesting to iRobot. So iRobot decided to acquire our company. And uh, as part of the acquisition, they asked me to become the CTO at iRobot and help them integrate our visual navigation technology across their product portfolio, which is Roomba primarily. So now Roombas are no longer random. They're smarter now. Visually, they can actually map the house, uh, figure out how to go from room to room and cover every single square inch of the floor not to miss a spot. So uh, that, would, that would be my contribution probably to iRobot. Oh, thank you. Um, you used the term there, SLAM. Could you spell that out? Yes, yeah, simultaneous localization and mapping. Is, is the name of the technology. And what does that mean in robotics? So it turns out that one of the uh, hard things in robotics, at least when we started in early 2000, was how does the robot figure out where it is in an in a environment and how does it know how to get to where it wants to go? So this is something for people that may not be uh, in technology, it's hard to imagine. Why would it be hard for a robot to know where it is? Well. It is hard because the robot has no point of reference. So it has to have some way of measuring where it is in the environment relative to something. Uh, and so uh, many different approaches have been uh, used, but SLAM, really the notion of simultaneous localization mapping became the solution, which is basically a very simple concept is that if I was given a portion of a map, if someone handed me a map of a building and said, figure out where you are on this map. I could look around myself and measure distance to walls and compare it to the map and say, oh, okay, it looks like I'm at this corner because I see a door, I see a window, and I see the same thing on a map, so I know where I am. But if you are not given a map, which is a, a situation with a robot, the robot does not have a map. The other thing would be to say, if I knew my position very accurately and I start measuring uh, what I perceive in my environment and so I'm drawing that I can start drawing out the map, right? But the problem is that the robot also doesn't know where it is because its position accuracy is very bad because usually you can measure your relative position using the onboard sensors such as odometer and inertial uh, navigation systems to measure your position, which is like odometer in your car, but that is not very accurate. 
when you start moving away from your initial position, your position starts drifting. So you have to have an external fix, right? That's why with the odometer of your car, you could not do what the GPS does for our current cars with navigation system. So, so it's a chicken and egg problem. If I had accurate positioning, I could build a map. If I had a map, I could figure out my position, but I have neither. So simultaneous localization mapping basically refers to the fact that you build a little bit of the map, use that as a reference point to position yourself relative to that piece of the map, then go to the next section of the map and figure that out and then stitch this piece, puzzle, uh, puzzle pieces together to get the entire map. And now you will be able to localize yourself anywhere in that map. Wow. And that's why uh, Visual Slam was basically using a camera uh, to uh, find visual feature points or fiducial points in the environment and use those to figure out your position and build the map from. It definitely falls into the category of easier said than done by the sound of it. Um, and now your company is embodied. And can you talk about what your vision is there? Yeah, Embodied is a company that's developing uh, AI-based interactive characters to help enhance human life and experience in a very broad terms. So the first uh, few years of the company has been focused on developing this platform, technology platform we call Social X, which is as opposed to user experience, we're talking about social experience where you have an interactive robot that can interact with you using the same cues that we use in interacting with each other, which is eye contact, facial expressions, intonation of voice, body language, and so on, instead of using mouse devices and keyboards and touch screens. So we can interact with machines the way we interact with each other. And the application area we are focused on short term is focusing on helping children with social, emotional, and cognitive development. And longer term, we want to uh, help fam uh, individuals that have social isolation for any reason. Actually, uh, during COVID, that is a lot more relevant now, or people can relate to it a lot more now than before. But nonetheless, uh, with the elderly care, elderly population growing, and even the new millennial generation choosing to live alone, loneliness and social isolation is actually a pandemic of its own, right? Uh, and we, we want to be able to develop robots that are providing companionship on one hand, but also are working on, for children, it's about neurodevelopmental skills, helping children develop their uh, skills on a neuro neurodevelopmental side. Uh, a lot of it is with social skills and emotional regulation skills and communication skills. And then for the elderly, it becomes to uh, slow down neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's, memory, dementia, and so on by having companionship, motivating them to stay active, not replacing what they need to do with a robot, but actually having the robot becoming a motivator, a coach to guide them to get them motivated to do their, the things they need to do. Take your medication, maybe you need to do an next guide. Maybe you need to go for a walk. Maybe you need to call your uh, daughter and uh, catch up with what's going on with their life and so on. So keep creating an anchor for them to wanting to live more independently. And then in the next, uh, if you go push out the horizon to the 10 plus years, uh, we want to marry that technology of companionship with uh, physical interaction so we can actually help uh, providing physical assistance to people that may need it. Again, if you think about elderly that may have mobility impairments, just getting out of bed, having the safety to go to the bathroom, right? Having a support, uh, we want to do that long term. Uh, to provide basically assistive care for the elderly population and other populations that are vulnerable in our society uh, while preserving dignity and providing compassion. That's an incredible vision. I've got so many questions. We're going to start with talking about your robot Moxie, which uh, 
because uh, some of the people listening to this podcast won't be in a position to click on a link, maybe they're driving. Can you describe what Moxie looks like? So Moxie looks like a Pixar character uh, in physical embodied form, and hence the name of the company, Embodied. Uh, so it's a it's a robot that uh, is about a foot and a half tall. It's stationary, this first version. It, do, it doesn't have mobility, meaning it doesn't move around in the home. It's equipped with a number of sensors. It has body language, so it has arms for gesticulation. It has a very expressive face. We actually created a curved screen so that it doesn't look like a flat panel monitor stuck inside the robot, but it's actually curved. curve. Uh, it has very expressive graphics on the face, and it has body language that is very expressive. Uh, the sensors can, can consist of a high-resolution camera, which is used primarily to recognize the user, understand uh, the body language of the user, look for the eyes of the user, and make eye contact. The robot has a face, as I mentioned. It has eyes. So it will make eye contact in a very believable way. It can smile back at you. It has a mic array that is used to understand what you say. So you can have natural language conversation with it. And it will respond with a synthetic voice that sounds very realistic and emotive. So it can sound sad when it's uh, uh, trying to express empathy. It can sound supportive and motivating when it wants to motivate the child to perform certain tasks and so on. Uh, and it has also has some sensors when you t if you touch it, pick it up, and so on. It measures all of those and and can be. so. That is in a in a nutshell. It's a interactive cartoon character brought to life, wow. which can interact with you. You can talk to it, you can gesture at it, and uh, it will do the same to you. And it's doing. Is it doing facial emotion recognition like affectiva? Correct. So. Uh, it does, both from audio and from the camera images, it does extract uh, features that can allow us to estimate the child's emotional state, both from the intonation of the voice of the child, from the sentiment of the words the child is using in the conversation, but also from facial expression. Uh, so uh, that is used in real time for the robot to be able to, to re be responsive. For instance, if the child is talking about a day where uh, she or he had a bad day and so on, the robot will actually understand the sentiment of the conversation, show empathy by looking a little bit more sad. And also the intonation of robot's voice will change to express a bit of uh, sort of sadness. Uh, but also uh, we do much deeper analytics of these uh, uh, signals to measure a child's development over time. As I mentioned, we are working on social, emotional, and cognitive skills. Each of these have a long list of targets that we are focused on. Uh, and we are measuring how the child is evol evolving over time. And this data is actually provided in a dashboard to the parent in a parent app. So this analytics to, to help parents gain insights into their child's development. And is this processing all on board or is any in the cloud? So all of the processing I just talked about is actually on board and running on a $10 processor. Uh, this was one of the key things we wanted to accomplish, which was we did not want to end up with yet another $40,000, $50,000 robot that only a handful of people or institutions can afford. We actually wanted this to have impact. So uh, we had to go to, uh, to be similar to ownership of a smartphone, like an iPhone, right? And the business model is the same. So you pay for the robot, plus you pay a similar fee for a subscription for the robot. But all in all, in for the first year of ownership, including one year of subscription, it's about a fifteen hundred dollars to own Moxie. Uh, the only part that is not running uh, on board the robot is actually the voice recognition, which is a, one part of the whole stack of technology, which is taking the sound clip of what you said pushes it into cloud. Actually, we work with Google and we use Google ASR, automatic speech recognition, to re transcribe what was said and a text stream comes back to the robot. And then the rest of it happens on the robot. The robot has to decipher what was meant, what was the meaning of what the child said, and then find an appropriate response, which the, our NLP stack does, and then the robot will respond. So if you say, for instance, 
I had a really bad day today. The, the audio clip goes to, to cloud. We get a text that sounds mostly like what I just said. There will be noise in it. Some of the words may be misrecognized. And then our NLP stack will say, oh, okay, this is, that means the child is not feeling good. The robot will respond, do you want to tell me more? Uh, and then the con- conversation will continue. Now, you've extracted the text content out there, but are you merging that in with the emotional uh, interpretations because they could be contradictory? Absolutely, yes. And there is a, this is the, uh, the uh, I don't want to say holy grail is not the right word. This is the crux of robotics is that what makes robotics challenging is that you never have 100% accurate data. For instance, when I type on my keyboard, when I type, press on the key P, the computer knows exactly what, what key I pressed. Now, there can be an error when I'm typing, maybe instead of pressing P, I press O, but the robot gets O. I mean, the computer gets O. Whereas with a, with a computer, with a robot, you never, you're never sure because there's noise in the sensors, there's noise in the environment, especially for speech recognition and with accents like myself or children that may have some speech challenges or lisping. Uh, the TV is playing in the background, mom and dad are having a conversation and child is talking to the robot. How do you decipher all of this? to extract what the child said, because there will be noise in the data that you get. And that is the, the trick, right? That's the, that's the challenge and the trick of building robots that actually work in the real world. Mm. And I've seen your promotional piece for this, which we'll link to, which shows the parents of a young boy named Riley being uh, presenting him with a, a moxie. And can you talk about in that piece, what is special about Riley and what it does Moxie achieve through interactions? By the way, I'm saying Moxie. Is it a he, she, or an it? Uh, actually, it's a gender neutral robot. We have purposely decided to make it gender neutral because the child will can decide if they want to ascribe gender to it or call it it. Uh, and we see a mix right some some call it a she some call it a he and some call it a it the robot is not shy about saying that it's a robot it's not pretending that it's it's something else uh going back to your question regarding the uh, the piece we have on the promotional video uh so riley is a reserved child as it's portrayed in the video uh which means that they don't enjoy interacting with other people or don't do it for other reasons such as social media and youtube videos and all the other devices and screen time that is actually stealing a lot of attention from us adults as well as children and you want to bring them out to be able to socially interact so what you see there is that moxie obviously it's a robot it's a very cute robot it's going to draw them out and wanting to interact with moxie and you would say well what the heck are you accomplishing if you're replacing one technology with another to draw the child out well the point is that moxie is actually using body language and facial african voice and so on it's not focused on the screen and just typing and the way moxie's program has been developed by our team of uh game developers from child sort of children's uh, content and our uh, child development experts is to bring you out, start engaging with some activities, have the child share some of their thoughts and feelings with the robot. And then the robot will encourage the child to go do an activity in the real world. So in the, in the spot, you also see the, the sort of the last uh, few seconds is where Moxie encourages the child to go talk to a friend and come and report back. So it's like a mission, a challenge you give to the child and children are actually very excited about accepting these challenges from Moxie and then they go do the physical activity and then next time they see Moxie, they report to Moxie. Uh, So that's bringing the kid out of their shell and using Moxie as a springboard into the real world. That's the goal. Got it. So Um, Help me understand how this manages to be successful. On the face of it, this is 
On the face of it, this looks like a very difficult task. It's not like Alexa, which people would be very forgiving of, gives the wrong answer, no one minds. Here you're dealing with children that are socially or emotionally challenged. You've got to establish rapport using a robot with a child that apparently adults have failed to be able to do the same. And yeah. it looks like a minefield, not least from a <laughs> technical standpoint, but uh, a legal one. Uh, okay, that's a lot of questions. Where do you want to start? Well, I mean, I think the core of your your uh, question is a very good question, is that this is super challenging. How, how are you going to succeed? And absolutely, it was not lost on me when I left my job as the CTO of iRobot to go start this, that this is a complete moonshot project. Um, and we have we cannot declare victory yet, right? We have we have just announced the product. We are taking reservations for it right now. And we will be shipping to the customers end of this year. Although we have been testing with hundreds of families uh, and continuously improving the product. So there is a list of challenges that have to do with technology. Uh, how does Moxie not say the wrong thing? And sometimes it does, right? And how do you cover that? Again, in my experience, 20 plus years of experience in technology and focus on consumer products, I, in, as a matter of fact, no technology is 100% perfect when it comes to robotics. So you have to find a way to uh, manifest the technology where it's strong and cover it up when it's failing. So hopefully the failures will be covered up. Uh, and will not affect the user experience. So we are working on that and we are continue improving it. Uh, there are a long list of challenges. We have solved a lot of them and there is another five to 10% we need to keep improving on still before we ship to the customers. Then comes other challenges, which is if you cannot keep the child engaged over the long run, you will not be able to have an impact on their behavior. And that is the ultimate goal, is to have a positive impact on child's development and behavior. Um, so that requires longer term engagement, which depends on what Moxie does. What are the activities? Okay, let's say the technology is perfect. Moxie will never say anything wrong. But how does the Moxie keep uh, the child engaged and wanting to interact with it over a long run? We're not talking about hours or days. We're talking about many, many, many months. Something that has never been done before, by the way. Uh, and we call that content. So we have a team of amazing people from our backyard here in Burbank, Glendale, is where all the studios are from Disney to Jim Henson Company to Nickelodeon and so on. And we have assembled a very strong team of uh, experts from that field that are developing content that's going to keep the child engaged and motivated on the long run. We actually... Three weeks ago, launched a, a beta program with 100 families who have been using Moxie. And so far, the results are very encouraging. We are three weeks into it, and we see good engagement. Again, we are way beyond what has been done before, but that's not our goal. We want to go about 10 times longer than that. And the jury is out how far we can keep the engagement. Uh, so that's the other thing. And then finally, the engagement is just a hook gives us an opportunity to, to deliver the, uh, the pill, if you will, to help the child improve there. So in the interaction, Moxie is deploying a lot of techniques from child development, best practices, evidence-based therapy, and so on, to help children scaffold a lot of their skills in these areas we are talking about. And it's a long process. It's, so the robot is constantly measuring how the child is doing, and then helping them go to the next level and the next level and the next level. The ultimate success for us is when the child no longer needs Moxie. When the child is successful in generalizing the behaviors that they learn from the robot in interacting with their peers in their, in their social circle. You talked about having a finite engagement, like Moxie is not going to be a permanent pal for, for, someone. It's like a, a course of therapy in, in that respect. But nevertheless, we're talking days, if not weeks of engagement. Right now, 
makers of AI chatbots struggle to maintain seconds, let alone minutes, of context. Now, to, to what extent are you able... Okay, maybe we were getting into proprietary trade secret territory here, but if you don't mind <laughs> 10,000 people signing an NDA, never mind. Um, <laughs> to what extent does the success of Moxie hinge upon being able to remember something that happened in a conversation two days earlier? Uh, it does depend to some extent. It's a good question. I don't know the actual answer to that, and we will find out. But what we have seen is that Moxie does have memory uh, about certain things. And one thing just to your broader comment is a very good question, is that how do you sustain interest of a child in interacting with a robot for more than seconds, which seems to be the state of the art right now, right? You were saying the chatbots uh, cannot sustain interest for more than seconds, maybe minutes, and we are talking about months. Uh, well, it's a combination of a number of things. One is pushing the, the uh, sort of frontier of technology to the next level. The other part is how we are um, programming the content structure. So let me talk briefly about that because that I think will explain a lot of things. So we have what we call scripted content where Moxie is actually proactively engaging the child in doing certain activities. Uh, the way it's structured is that we have weekly themes that are focused on things that we want children to learn about. So a weekly theme, the first weekly theme, for instance, is about learning about emotions. And every day of the week is a new episode, if you will, in the theme. So this is structured content, like start, very structured programming. And Moxie will engage with the child to get them to start working on activities that are going to help them understand their emotions better. And then you go to more complex things. So now once I can label my emotions and, and understand how to relate to my emotions, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And I put a label on it. I don't even need to analyze it into too much depth. I put a label. I say, okay, this feeling is called A. This one is called B. This one is called C. Then next day, we go in deeper with some of those emotions and start teaching children how to understand where they're coming from. And then we go deeper and start teaching them how to manage their emotions, right? So there are activities like mindfulness activities, breathing exercises, and our techniques we teach children in learning how to do And by the way, the, the trick here is to make it fun at the same time, right? There's the sugar coating and then there's the medicine, right? This is the... This is the blending that's been very challenging. So then in between these transitions from very structured content, we do deploy generative NLP uh, technology that is filling the gaps. But if you will, we have created enough uh, posts in between so that the jump between these poles is not too bad. That means the technology wouldn't fall into water there. So between there, let's say, for instance, uh, we go to more complex themes like understanding what does kindness mean? So what will ask the child, what does kindness mean? I mean, that is a technology begging for trouble when you ask such open-ended question because you could get any answer you want. And then we have a blending of the, the structured scripted content and the chatbot content that is blended in a nice way to provide uh, enough variety for the child not to say, oh, okay, this is just every time the robot says exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, not going off the rails and say for the robot to say something completely inappropriate. So that blend, so we put it in inside guardrails, which is the scripted content. And within that guardrail, we allow the mm -hmm. NLP AI system to navigate freely in between those. But we have put these guardrails around that. And then we have put some safety measures on top of it. For instance, there's a filter uh, on the robot's output in terms of what the robot will say that will take away anything that's inappropriate, profanities or themes or topics that we never want to touch because the it would be responsible of us to, to touch those topics. Let's say death and stuff like that. We don't have enough context to even talk about those things, right? Uh, so that's how it's designed to... Uh, help the technology navigate within these guardrails that are designed by experts that are child development experts and experts from content for children. So that makes a very important point, which is that if you can narrow the context enough, then 
the uh, subject will be willing to forgive the cognitive lapses. Is it fair to say then that you're relying on building empathy between the, the, the child and Moxie here to, to keep that relationship going? Absolutely. And that's actually a very good point. And I didn't mention that. I'm glad you asked this question. Actually, the whole context of how Moxie gets introduced to the child is that the child is uh, Moxie's mentor. Uh, so there is a background story about this, but I will spare you for the background story. But basically, we say Mo Moxie is here to learn from children how to become a better friend to humans. So Moxie is positioning itself as a robot. I'm a robot. I want to learn how to become a better friend to humans. Can you teach me? I don't know a lot about the human world and human, the hu humans in general. So that's why when Moxie says, can you tell me what kindness? I've learned that I've heard that kindness is important to know and understand. Can you explain to me what kindness is? So that allows the child, first you're building this, this uh, relationship where the child is not the target right? The child is actually in the position of power to say, oh, I'm here to take care of Moxie. I'm here to look out for Moxie's learning. I'm on this mission for the betterment of humanity. So that already predisposes the child to be more forgiving of the robot as well, but also it puts them in a the power of position that I'm not a target. I'm not being scrutinized here. I'm actually helping Moxie to get better. And by doing that, the child is getting better, obviously. Mm. Okay, well, unsurprisingly, this interview also lasted longer than one episode's worth of time, and so we will get to the rest of it in the next week's episode. In some of the latest headlines about robotics, the company X-Wing has developed an autonomous plane. They have a modified Cessna that can fly without a pilot. They're working with the FAA to get certification for an unmanned 9,000 pound Cessna with cargo capacity over 4,000 pounds. Now it's long been a truism in air travel that the majority of the time that a passenger aircraft spends in the air is on autopilot. But we still have pilot and co-pilot in the cockpit because of the time spent getting from the gate into the air and vice versa. But surely the problem of navigating around an airport runway system is much simpler than one that self-driving cars have to solve. So if we can build self-driving cars, we ought to be able to build aircraft that can go from gate to gate without a driver or pilot. The main reason by far that we haven't done that is that no one wants to fly in a plane where there isn't a pilot up front who is going to die first if something goes wrong. It's called shared fate. You want to trust your life to someone who will also lose their life if they mess up. But X-Wing is not targeting passenger aircraft, it's looking at cargo aircraft. So there is no one to object to not having their fate shared with the pilot. In other robot news, a Chinese business claiming to be the world's first robot restaurant complex has opened in southern Guangdong province. You have robot waiters taking orders and delivering food prepared by robot chefs. The scale of this place is what makes it fascinating. They have a capacity of nearly 600 diners seated and... 40 robots capable of cooking 200 dishes or so. And while it may have been developed for novelty appeal more than anything else, it certainly has some applicability in a post-coronavirus world. Speaking of understanding of the real world and abstract concepts of values, there is a site now called philosopherai.com, which is hooked up to GPT-3, which we've been talking about on the show several times. You can type in a question about philosophy, and it will answer it. Now, it's doing this based on its 175 billion parameter model built from text that it's harvested from the internet, but it's amazing just how responsive, how human-like those responses are. It will write an entire story in response to a prompt that looks in general usually like a pretty good essay that you might set for homework in high school or college. 
Plagiarism detection or homework cheating just got a whole lot harder. I gave it a prompt, which was, quote, AI cannot understand the real world until robots have experienced it, end quote. Something in the theme of this episode. Here's part of its response. Humans are never able to experience the totality of reality and thus cannot completely understand it. This is because they can only ever be in one place at a time, for now. But what sets humans apart from machines is their ability to understand this fact, that we will never fully grasp reality as a whole. This acknowledgement of our own incompleteness and inability to grasp reality as a whole may seem depressing, but I do not think it need be so. If we accept that this is the case, then rather than trying to create machines with such abilities, we should let robots have their own experience of reality. And it finishes with this paragraph. I have decided not to end this statement here because I believe it is important that robots do not become too human-like. This means they should be allowed to develop their own experience of reality and then work out the implications for themselves. Now, bear in mind, it's not just looking for paragraphs out on the internet that it can cut and paste here. You won't find that exact paragraph or the other ones anywhere out there. It has built them in response to some kind of model based on my prompt. Again, as I keep saying, it's not understanding the real world or anything that it's saying here, but it is certainly doing a much better impression of it than anything else has until now. And at some point, we will have to ask ourselves the question of whether that impression is as good as the real thing. We've got a long way to go to get there, but we're on the way. Next week's episode, we will conclude the interview with Paolo Pajanian. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.